This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics, dare to sound different. Are we starting now? Are we on? Are we on? We're we're uh, yeah, ready, ready to go. Oh, I love it! I lo- look. Thank you very know, much. You're, well, look, you're thank busy, you for having me. Normally, there's like a there's a 15 minute discussion about getting the headphones in the right place. Are you recording locally? But we can actually crack on. Well, look, Tom, it's great to be with you today. <laughs> and how much does music mean to me? You know, funnily enough, I would probably say that. There are people for whom music defines their life, their mood. Every historical moment is infused with some music or the other. I think it's very deep to the way I think about the world. But when I talk to my wife about music and how Morrissey and the Smiths completely um, helped to construct her identity, I don't think it's quite had that relationship with me. So I think, like a lot of people, very important, but perhaps not the only important thing in life no of course of course and it's uh as somebody who's been getting increasingly addicted to music it's something that uh you know i realize that it's not you know it's not the only thing it's not the only passion but that said you have chosen some superb uh, songs that i mean would you uh, classify these as your favorite songs well, what I, what I thought I'd do is I've, I picked a few uh, when I got your very kind email. I thought I'd pick a few that had a particular meaning for me. Um, so I love them. I love the songs. I hope uh, your listeners like at least some of them. I know that the music, what do you think about this, Todd? I've been thinking a lot about the subjectivity of music taste. Do you, do you think it, and I've been puzzling about it for quite a long time. Like, for example, with ice cream, whether you like vanilla, strawberry or chocolate seems to me entirely arbitrary. It just depends on the construction of your taste buds and how they connect to the brain. Music isn't just an arbitrary thing, though, is it? I mean, it is subjective, but there's something more to it. Would, would you agree with that? Uh, probably. But then again, you know, as much as I can listen to the Beatles, and you've chosen two Beatles songs here, as much as I can listen to the Beatles and say, you know, there is absolutely no way that anyone could say this is bad music. There's no way that anyone could deny the sort of superlative creativity and personality that's just so incredible and and unique in in this music. Uh, I sometimes play the Beatles to to sort of uh, jazzers in inverted commas um, who, who are incredible musicians and have really sophisticated taste in music and they just don't get it. They just think I'm listening to the boring stuff. I, I know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's that, shocking. Well, it's interesting. It's very interesting because I think there are certain types of music that kind of transcend cultural particularities. Mm. There are others that are very, um, very context dependent. You really have to understand the time, the place, the mood to, to, to get a sense of why it had meaning. It's interesting you say they didn't get the Beatles because I think that is quite transcendent. I wouldn't be at all surprised if the Beatles is listened to in a couple of hundred years' time. I think it's no. one of those. I mean, it's it's it's. Yeah, I agree with you. I think there's something very profound about the Beatles. I, I really don't know what it is in in a way other than. I mean, I know you were sort of saying it, it, context dependent, and it, I think having listened to the Beatles really early on and watching their anthologies really early on, sort of before I listened to anything, you know, as a, as a child of the '90s, I wasn't listening to the Oasis or you know something like that in the '90s. I was listening to the Beatles. So it is context dependent. A lot of the people I've had on this podcast always talk about the Ed Sullivan appearance, yes. wanting them musicians who've come on here. I, sort of about probably about thirty percent of mu- the great musicians who come on here say the reason why they wanted to become a professional musician, you know, whether it's Earth, Wind, and Fire or Toto or whoever it is, they just say it was the Ed Sullivan moment. So there, you know, very in- transcendent. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that really, really interesting because I think it says something about culture and how societies feel a sense of unity and and solidarity. As if you rewind 50 years, there used to be BBC television programmes that half the nation would watch. Mm. You know what I mean? You know, Jubilees and uh, World Cup final of 1966. You know, because the culture 
was relatively unified. There were shared experiences that we all had, and therefore one could talk about a unifying cultural consensus of some kind or another. America had that with the Ed Sullivan show. I mean, you mentioned that half the 30% of the musicians actually watched that show. That could never happen today. You know, because of this long tail of content, you know, there's different great podcasts, by the way. You get more diversity is a wonderful thing because mm. you can listen to podcasts on music, on popular science. You can watch TV programs on 157 channels. But I bet you there will never be anything like that again. Never something like an Ed Sullivan show of 2021 that you would interview somebody in 2070 and they'll all say, we listen, you know, 2050, and say, we all listen to that at the same time. We watched it, we talked about it at the water cooler, because it just doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And in a way, do you think, I mean, I think there was a book published relatively recently, uh, sort of saying that the era of the rock star is over. And uh, I mean, you do get super famous people in the music yeah. industry, like B Justin Bieber, or, you know, people like that, Ed Sheeran. Um, although even he feels like he's a bit kind of old he's not but you know Ariana Grande you still get superstars right but yeah you don't get that kind of sense that everybody's tuned into the exact same thing everybody's watching right. the same tv show every almost yeah. everybody that I talk to listens to a completely different set of artists yeah. they have different podcasts yeah. to the ones that I listen to they prefer you know different sources of of news um yeah. it's it's weird. Do you think it's going to have a positive or negative effect on society in general, different it's in a different very contexts? It's a great question, Ty. I think it's a very open question. I, I, I can see massive advantages of it. I mean, I can tune into my own, I can, as it were, curate my own stream of podcasts. I can watch exactly what I want at whatever time I want. It's not like when I was 10 uh, and everyone watched EastEnders when Dirty Den died all at the same time and we had something to talk about. So I think there's something, you know, you have these virtual communities that are very cohesive, but I do sometimes worry that societies are losing that sense of togetherness, which is obviously important in a pandemic, right? Because, you know, people have to have some sense of social solidarity to do things that prevent chains of transmission or whatever i don't want to get too political it's a musical podcast but oh, you know no, no. We, we, we 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 talk about all sorts of current affairs things and i i mean okay. I, want, I want to talk about music first but then i do i do yeah, want to yeah. sort of you know because i i love your column in the times um and uh and you know i'm looking forward to reading your books you know because I, I was i was drawn to to invite you onto the podcast um from reading your columns in the times which started during uh the beginning of uh, of lockdown and we do frequently discuss um current affairs and things so i'd be interested right. to 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 get your 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 views on on a, on a few of them um but that said uh, it would be good to, to know what moments you know if, if these songs tie into moments what moments um well starting with the beatles i feel fine you know what why does that have sentimental value so I feel fine. I've got to tell you. Uh, okay, so so I'm a, I don't know if you, how much you know about me, Tom, but I used to play table tennis. I do. I, I, right. I, I, I was, I was a, a champion. I, I was the British number one for a decade. Um, and, it, you know, even though that sounds pretty true, a lot of people in the UK think of table tennis a bit like tiddlywinks, you know, kind of tiny yeah. parlour game. But there's about a million regular players, you know, about 50,000 people who pay a subscription to the governing body, obviously very big in China and in other parts yeah. of the world. So it's quite a So it's ferociously competitive. Um, but I have very fond memories of starting this journey as a, as a, like an eight, nine year old in suburban Reading and playing my school team and gradually graduating up the ranks. And what happens, Tom, is you, you, you sort of get to a level where instead of playing in the local league, the Reading League, where you would go to a you know a particular you know a hut with a table in in, in Sonning Common and you would play against you know three old timers with their old hard pimpled bats, <laughs> you would suddenly start playing in tournaments, tournaments you know in in Gloucester or in Milton Keynes and Leighton <laughs> Buzzard and 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 Middlesbrough, and and funny enough the tournament in Middlesbrough. So this is called the Cleveland Select. And it's a drive, I've got to tell you, it's about a six-hour six drive to get there. But, you know, we were keen, and my parents, who weren't terribly well-to-do, would, would put all their savings into petrol. But it'd obviously share cars, right, because you didn't want to have to everyone to pay for the petrol on their own. 
So I went to the Cleveland one year with a guy called Andy Wellman. Now, he was a lot older than me. He was, had just become a school teacher in mathematics, and he lived quite near where we were. He was a good table tennis player, a lot better than me, but he was about 10, 15 years older. And back then, of course, the really good cars had radios. And the really, really, really good cars also had a cassette player. <laughs> and Wellman... And Andy Wellman, if you're listening, in fact, I'm going to try and make sure he listens. I haven't spoken to him for about 30 years, but I hope he's listening. Wellman had a cassette player. And we're, we're sort of, you know, we hit the M1. And he said, look, I'm going to stick on a, uh, on a cassette. And, and I'm going to, it's, it's a Beatles. It's a Beatles cassette. And it was mainly that early stuff. And then I Feel Fine came on. And, and you'll know that it starts with that sort of guitar feedback. Mm, and I kind of, and, 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 and it's just an amazing opening, and and it's a it is to this day. I think it is. I listen to it, uh, every, Tom, every week. It, it, whenever I want to feel good about myself, about the world, I play. I feel fine. It's a Lennon song. It's a classic Lennon song in those early days. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, Wellman said to me at the end of it, he said, "That is the greatest song that has ever been written." And I, you know, and I just looked at him, and I looked up to Wellman, and I thought, you know what, Andy, Andy Wellman. You're absolutely right. And whenever I listen to it, it just takes me back to the table tennis journeys, you know, going up the, the, the bird lit passage in Gloucester or, you know, all of these weird routes. Because back then you didn't have a sat nav. So we'd get lost and you have to stop and wind down the window and say, excuse me, do you know where the Thornaby Pavilion Sports <laughs> Centre is? And they'll say, yeah, fourth up there on the left. It's just an incredible set of memories. Yeah, yeah. When things tied to memories like that, it just makes the song even better but it is such a brilliant song and it's easy to I, I sometimes feel the later beatles tracks especially in the age of streaming have ended up being given a, a huge amount a disproportionate amount of focus things like let it be here comes the sun uh, and and the early era was equally brilliant in in some ways i mean i feel fine as you say, it's the classic Lennon song. And Lennon's contributions did somewhat wane towards the end i mean you still had things that come together but uh, it was Paul McCartney writing the bulk of the stuff sort of from 1967 onwards. And, uh, and John Lennon, you know, it, a lot of people would call him the, the leader of the group. It certainly feels like uh, kind of the, in the dynamics of the group, they would look up to him and, and really try and win, win his favour. And even now, Paul McCartney in interviews kind of really tries to come across like him and John were friends. He's always talking yeah. to sort of whoever it is, Jimmy. And I, I think that's kind of very demonstrative of the fact that John was kind of in the, in the driving seat. But, but musically, it was around this time that he was at his kind of peak in the Beatles, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, the, the dynamic between Paul, Paul and John. I mean, I've tried to listen to as many interviews with, with Paul uh, as possible. It's a wonderful one. I don't know if you heard it with Jarvis Cocker. Uh, yeah, where yeah. He interviews McCartney at uh, at his old school. There's a recent one with um, with Adam Buxton, which is yeah, which I is very good. Uh, there's also uh, there's one on the BBC. Uh, I can't remember the name of the series. Uh, Master Master something Master Tracks or something like that. It's on Radio um, but, Four. Uh, yeah, right, and it's, it's televised as well. It's uh, a wonderful was, audience. Yeah, maybe I saw that one. Yeah. yeah, I mean, my, my own set, I mean, I, I, I'm, as you know, I'm very interested in, in understanding great human performance and trying to deconstruct how it happens. I think music is particularly difficult to deconstruct, um, but the, I think it is impossible to disentangle Lennon from McCartney, to understand where the contribution of one stops and the other begins. Um, they were clearly working together, as we know from a very young age, the creative sparks that they fired in each other led to a whole being much greater than the sum of the parts. I think it's difficult to say who was the greater songwriter. I mean, mm. I have a, you know, for what it's worth, I have probably a deeper affection in some ways for McCartney than, uh, than Lennon, but, but I think ultimately it shows the power of human collaboration more than anything else. And it's, it's one of the, I think one of the, historically great collaborations because w when you think about many of the people who have achieved in culture and science is they've often had a very well-to-do background they're extremely well connected they've had a lot of hidden advantages that other people didn't have but McCartney and Lennon didn't really have that they 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 were extra I mean the one thing to bear in mind is they're extraordinarily hard working 
I mean, as you know, the 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 amount of gigs they played in that mm. period in Germany, uh, in um, in Hamburg, wasn't Hamburg, it? yeah. Uh, it's just remarkable, and and you can see how it built their social put this sort of social confidence in a performance way. But the amount they were just constantly writing and absorbing musical influences is is also, I think, a tribute to their psychology as much as their creativity. Yeah, that's really interesting, and it is impossible to separate the two of them. And yeah, I mean, in a way, in some ways, at least Paul McCartney has demonstrated. A songwriting ability, melodic ability, maybe more than Lennon, but it's kind of futile comparing them, and uh, and it's it's weird because they really were, as you say, a true collaboration, and there have been others that have followed, and there are other great songwriting um, partnerships, but nowadays I really I don't see that many um, in commercial music. There are not that many bands, and there are not that many songwriting duos. Well, well I mean, I, look, I know much less about this than you, but I, I, I do look at trends in creative output. And, and my sense, and tell me if I'm wrong about this, is that if you rewind a couple of hundred years, particularly classical composers would, would compose alone. Hmm. With, with Lennon and McCartney, they composed together. I mean, some of their songs were written alone and it came under the Lennon McCartney tagline, but often they'd actually write in the same room together. As I understand it now, there are very diverse songwriting teams. So if you think of uh, Max Martin, uh, who is a Swedish songwriter, mm. um, who learned under a guy called Dennis Pop in, in Stockholm at a label called Cheerion, you know, he assembles these very diverse teams of different songwriting influences and then brings them together for artists who may also be part of the compositional process. Exactly. I mean, in comedy writing, diverse teams and a lot of film writing diverse teams certainly in soap operas diverse teams uh, in science um, in technology i mean there are some areas like writing a novel you don't want a diverse team you need to have a real single authorial voice but more and more the trend seems to be towards diverse teams of creative um individuals yeah i think that's uh, and, and, i think that's a shame i think i mean i like the idea of i like the idea of lots of people getting the opportunity to be involved and lots, you know, lots of people, but it's kind of, I think it dilutes the heart and soul too much to have, because often you have hit, hit singles and stuff these days written by sort of 10 plus people, 13, 15 writers, and some of them are great, but it's, it's that idea that, though, the, that Lennon and McCartney, they started off from nothing and they write all their songs together and they play their songs and they perform their songs. And, you, you know, yes, there would be a better technical vocalist than John Lennon. He's not going to be, you know, being named head chorister in his local church or winning any kind of, you know, he doesn't sing like boys to men, um, but it's sort of, it's just everything comes from them. It comes straight from their heart down onto the paper and the chords don't need to be the most sophisticated. And sometimes I feel like that's lacking. And also it would be great, you know, if some of these very talented pop stars, like it would be great to, to, to know what an album would sound like by Justin Bieber or Ariana Grande if they sat down and wrote it themselves rather than have 13 people write it for them. Not it's very interesting, I think. No, I, I, I totally get you. I think, I think in music, you, you make an extremely profound point. Um, for what it's worth, when it comes to science, it's impossible for one person to write a comprehensively important new paper because they don't have enough knowledge. Do, do you see what I mean? If mm. you're writing a big paper on engineering, you need experts for material science and maybe aerodynamics. So you have to fuse all of that information. I think in music, you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's a slightly different context. And, and I agree with you about the occasional, the fact that Lennon doesn't have the best voice of all time or that the chord may have been. I mean, I went and bought the vinyl albums um, uh, yeah, I've got most of the Beatles now, and uh, one, you know, some of the first pressings, and, and my wife. But, I mean, the reason, by the way, is that the first sports editor I ever worked under at the Times, David Chapel, now owns. He moved from sports editing, and he bought a vinyl record shop in Brighton, whose name I should mention on this podcast. Let me just get it. It's like a really famous old uh, record awesome. shop. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's really brilliant. Cool. And when he did it, I thought, you know what? I really ought to go and buy some some records. So my wife bought me a record player uh, two Christmases ago. 
and now I've got all the Beatles. But it's lovely listening to it on vinyl because you do hear mistakes and you know uh, in, in what well, the, the the great song. Um, uh, uh, oh gosh, uh, a day in the life. Mm. Um, I think you can hear something underneath that final chord at the end. You know, people moving chairs or something like that. Yeah, so yeah. It, in a funny kind of way, that adds to it. It really adds to it because also you can just picture them in Abbey Road and that just having happened. And when you hear the stories of them working there and them eating in the canteen and stuff, it's almost like they were at some sort of school, but they were really flourishing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Quite strange. By the way, I've got the name. It's called The Record Album. The Record in Album Brighton. in Brighton. Yeah, and it's, it's, that's it's cool. um, a treasure trove of collectible vinyl, and it's got all the classics. Um, and, and I've actually, I've, I went down to Brighton and went and spent a bit of, spent half a day in the shop. There's something beautiful about The other thing about the old albums is, you know, you've got the cover art, you know, there's, and you've got a kind of a tangible artifact that you can hold and, and show people. Whereas, of course, when you download it, it doesn't have that, that, that tangibility, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, there's something wonderful. And you could spend a lot of time in record shops just looking at the covers, look, uh, learning more about, about music, especially if they've got, you know, good owners um, and who, who are knowledgeable and, and great to chat to. They're, they're incredible places, record shops, and it, you know, hopefully they, they, uh, they survive. So, so oh, the next so. Beatles track you chose, Here, There and Everywhere, I mean, that is an exquisite tune. That is so good. Unbelievable. Well, look, I... I... I, I could go. So this is a McCartney song, of course, um, uh, and 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 perhaps his best. Perhaps his best. It's mm. it's, it's it's hauntingly beautiful. Um, I wrote a column in the Times, funnily enough, uh, to, to Tom, two days ago, where I don't know if you're into cricket. A guy called James Anderson um, bowled what's mm. now con already considered one of the greatest overs uh, in Test cricket. And he, he took two wickets against India. He got very close to an LBW. The ball was reverse swinging. And I wrote a, a, a piece about being in the zone, you know, being in that state of flow where everything is coming together. And I mentioned McCartney and uh, Here, There and Everywhere. I mean, obviously, a much more seminal achievement than Jimmy Anderson's over against India. <laughs> but as I understand it, McCartney recalls writing that, I think, in the spring of '66. Uh, whilst he was sat by the pool in John Lennon's home waiting for John to wake up. And he wrote the whole thing in a matter of minutes. It just flowed out of him. Um, and when you listen to the song, it, 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 you can almost get a sense of the zen-like creative process surging through McCartney at the time he wrote it. And... Um, uh, it, it has a particular meaning for me because I listen to it a lot. I mean, you, you mentioned a few of my books. When I wrote Rebel Ideas, which is my most recent um, book for adults, I listen to Here, There and Everywhere every day during my break. See, when you're writing, you obviously <clears throat> need to take breaks. Mm. You know, you're doing a bit of research, you know, you write it down and then you take a break. And Here, There and Everywhere would be, you can't listen to it on every break, otherwise it gets too samey. But I'd give myself the treat of once a day of here, there and everywhere, and it was just wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a, a beautiful song. Uh, that, I didn't know that about that story about him writing it. Um, but he, he indeed, I think, said it was, it could be his favourite of his compositions. I mean, he's done so much, but that would have been his flow state, as you say, the mid-60s. Mid to late 60s. And, and he does, yeah. I mean, in, in more than one interview, he, he's been asked, what, what, is the, what did you think is the best song you've ever written? And he, he nominates Here, There and Everywhere. And you can see why. I mean, it's, mm. it's, it's, it's just a perfect, it's a perfect uh, melody. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, the, the, the point about lots of different songwriters, I mean, one thing to say, uh, Kind of contradictory to, to what I was saying about sort of oh, it's a shame that you don't get Lennon and McCartney's too much and, and and the big teams of songwriters. I mean, they have kind of changed the definition, and and this goes back to what you were saying about science. You know, you need lots of different people contributing because people don't have the necessary expertise in each area. I mean, with music, obviously, you know, George Martin played a huge role, and and and. And obviously all of the different Beatles added their own thing. And it depends to what extent you're going to give people credit. I mean, I'm sure. literally, when I talk about songwriting, I'm literally just talking about the words, top line melody, chords, you know, because that pretty much is going to inform everything. 
But all of these this other people a, are contributing crucial things. But this is a very significant point about cultural change, is that if you think about it, when you try and determine who is the author of a particular song or the creator of a particular patent or a scientific idea, it's really very difficult to know where the influence of one person stops and the other person begins. Mm. I mean, if you think of Darwin, when he came up with the theory of evolution, Alfred Russell Wallace came up with the same theory at the same time because he had been hanging around in the same circles, had been listening to the same ideas. All scientists stand on the shoulders of giants and all musicians. I mean, when McCartney wrote Here, There and Everywhere, he had just spent a long time listening to the Beach Boys um, uh, their beautiful song that, that, whose title I'm just forgetting. And it, you can see a very direct influence from one to the other. John Lennon's good, I Feel Fine. No, Good Vibrations. No, it was um, no, the Pet Sounds really, album. Yeah, what was the great song on Pet Sounds, the, the, the top one? Um, Wouldn't it be nice is on there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Um, God only God knows. God only knows what. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. God yeah. Only so he yeah. just listened to that. I think I'm right in saying to get the comment. Yeah, so he was yeah. very influenced by that. And Lennon's, um, you know, the under tune for "I Feel Fine." It's 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 taken off another song. I mean, there's been, as you know, a lot of uh, allegations of plagiarism in songwriting for the simple reason that we're all influenced by everybody else, and we can't ever disentangle ourselves from that influence. It's an inevitable part of historical process. Um, and it's the same in science. You know, there's a sort of concept of the multiple where a load of different people came up with the same idea at the same time independently just because they were subject to the same set of basic influences. And um, when it comes to songwriting, you're right. Uh, G G George Martin played a massive role in, in what the Beatles did. And, and it's very difficult to completely disentangle um, the form it's the same in science by the way if you in sorry to go back to science but in scientific papers it would sometimes be one name on it now you sometimes have 30 names but you could mm. have 60 because they're all drawing on each other all the time yeah so, so there's something in the just the simple kind of the etiquette as it were of of how we're we're yeah. crediting things and, and now I think more with songwriting you know if someone yeah. plays a great bass part because, I mean, in a way, you know, you could apply this to like Motown, like the Jameson bass lines. You know, you could yeah. you could easily put him a songwriting credit, perhaps where he doesn't have one. And so I think maybe that's changing. But I still think there's some pretty bizarre uh, lacks of credit being given to people. You know, I've spoken to people uh, like like a couple of uh, a couple of artists who've sort of sung the chorus, sung the top line. You know, literally sung the main bit of a song. Or, or in some cases done all of the vocals, all of the, the lead vocals on a song, and they, they don't even have a feature credit. They're not even a, because because the, the track is a dance track and it's been you know given to the DJ. So it's it's strange. The etiquette seems to sort of go wherever these days. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, you're absolutely right. I think so. There's two. I think it's two things happening at the same time. One is the the etiquette. One is what is considered socially acceptable for who is formally credited on records, science papers, books. I mean, to what extent does a researcher for a book take credit for the output of that book or the editor of a book who massively changes its structure, rewrites a load of sentences? Um, so one issue is etiquette, but there is a phenomenon here of, uh, in the world today of, of even you know, over and beyond the etiquette of more interdisciplinary teams doing things together, um, it's true in everything, uh, Tom. From from creativity to intelligence agencies to, to, as I say, science to engineering, I think there is a trend there that is that is quite important. Um, but uh, I mean, what's your view? I mean, I've been interested in Max Martin only because of his extraordinary output. I mean, are you a, are you a fan? Yeah, I'm a fan because he's written so many great pop songs. I mean, I, I, I'm definitely no, um, no like snob as it were when it comes to pop music. You know, I love the old stuff, but Max Martin is 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 a genius, and uh, and I still keep up with all all the new things that are released. I mean, he's got a track record sort of going back. When did he start? In the late '90s. 
Yeah, I think it was the Backstreet Boys was his was was, his was first. the first stuff that he did. But then Britney and Taylor Swift and Katy Perry and uh, and and loads of others. I mean, he's I mean, you know, I'm not going to pretend I'm listening to that that music all the time. But then I do listen to the odd track, and 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 uh, it's more like and and it's more like you know, occasionally one of the songs, you know, Katy Perry, Hot and Cold, or, or you know, one of one of the ballads by the Backstreet Boys or something will will, will just find its way on a playlist, and I'll listen to it about five hundred times. Um, and and I respect that that pop craft, and I, I kind of want to like things. I think some people really, for kind of cultural reasons, uh, for sort of being cool reasons, or sticking to the sort of thing that they think is cool. Are quite closed off. I, I mentioned the, the sort of you know uh, the jazzers in inverted commas not liking the Beatles stuff. You know, for example, with jazz, like I really kind of want to like um, Miles Davis more than I do like Miles Davis. You know, should, should I go and try and figure out what what people see in jazz? I've never really got into it, but I know <laughs> Miles Davis is is kind of deified by by a lot of people. Yeah, well, I mean, I I, I do like jazz. Uh, but it's I don't like it as much as I would like to, if that makes yeah. sense. You know, like it's, like it's like me with Shakespeare. My my wife uh, list, would go and watch plays of Shakespeare when she was growing up, and her and her her mother, my mother in law, and I've never. And it's a terrible thing as a writer to admit this. I've never. I mean, even now, we went to the Globe um, before the pandemic. I think it was Henry V. <laughs> I just couldn't get my head around it. And I want to like. I want to be able to say, yeah, Shakespeare isn't it wonderful? But I, I've never quite. <laughs> never quite got it. I think it's actually very good to admit that because to be honest there must be people sort of saying oh no I, this opera is you know, this opera is fabulous right. or right. this this play is what this literature is wonderful and you know sometimes not maybe a hundred percent um believing it but whilst you know sometimes I can't appreciate jazz I can undoubtedly appreciate Lola's theme by the shapeshifters uh, or shapeshifters, rather, and uh, and uh, I was wondering what memory it tied to uh, for you. What so this is this is Matt, this is huge in my life. So so <laughs> this is maybe too much information, Tom. But I, I um, so I played table tennis, as you know. I finished school at sixteen. You know, went crazy playing table tennis. Went to Stockholm to to one of the best teams in Europe. Um, but my dad persuaded me to to come back and go to university, which I did. And then after university. Uh, I lived briefly in the north of England where the table tennis hub in this country happened to uh, be based. And then at the age of 25, about to turn 26, I bought my first flat in southwest London in a place called Richmond. And I still live mm. here. I love it here. Uh, so it's where I think I'll spend the rest of my life. So a shout out to anyone from Richmond listening in. Mm. And so I lived in, in Montague Road in Richmond and... Uh, and I was single. And I'd had a few relationships up to that point, but I was single for most of the time between the age of 25, 26, and when I met my wife when I was about 39. So th this period, I was, you know, mo you know, every three or four nights a week, I'd go to my local, which was a bar. There's two or three bars in Richmond. There was a pitcher and piano, all bar one. There's a couple of nice pubs. And there's just a little group of people, a lovely group of people. One, they, uh, a songwriter, I won a concert pianist, so there was some lovely creative people around and just loved hanging out. And the nightclub, a very infamous and slightly dodgy and highly cheesy nightclub Infernus. in Richmond, which is actually... No, sorry? not Infernus, that's Clapham. What, no, not, 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 not that one, no, no. Um, it's at the, actually, I now live about 80 yards from it. At the time, I lived about a five-minute walk up in Montague Road, but now I live very close to it. It was called Park Avenue, oh, yeah. uh, and it now, it's now called Viva. Um, but when it was called Park Avenue, I mean, obviously it hasn't been open for yonks, but it's the only nightclub in the town. But I would go there and Lola's theme would, would you know, in the early days came on and I absolutely fell in love with this tune. And I'd go there particularly with a friend called Tony, great guy, sadly has passed away uh, a few years ago. But we'd go there and we'd go crazy, the Lola's theme. So it got to the point, I became very good friends with the, with the manager of the club and the DJ, really, really friendly group of people. It wasn't a sort of snobbish club. It was a completely everyday, anyone can get in. There was virtually no dress code, but a yeah, lot the of The best fun. type of club. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And uh, and I'd go in, and I'm not kidding, as I came down the stairs, I'd sort of just turn into the club and the song would go off and on would come Lola's theme. And, you know, it, it's just a wonderfully rousing, happy, 
brilliant song and it, it, it's full of great memories. Yeah, it's one of the, one of the, the great uh, dance songs. Uh, Do you from... really like it? My wife couldn't get her head right. She was like, you really think this is one of the great songs? But you, it is a great song, It's right? a great dance song. It's a great... People put it on all the time. Uh, you know, when... Uh, probably, yeah, it was being played in clubs. People were just putting it on all the time. I mean, it's fun, you know. It's not Beethoven's Ninth, but it's it's just a great dance record and it's important to not be uh you know to to not to, to not admit that something is a great record because it's not like kind of seen it to be by a band who have like released kind of like 30 yeah. hit singles you know they're, right. they're, what, what did they do after that by the way this is the only song of theirs very, I know. very little uh right. or maybe not they, they maybe they didn't do very little but they they did very little that was of kind of mainstream i mean right. that was that was such a you know that was being played for sort of five, ten years. Mm. Well, I'm glad to hear that because um, it, it was ju it's just lovely. And and I, I still listen to it. You know, you know, we, you have those, you get to the, it may, it may happen today, I get to the end of the week, we've got uh, a kind of a sound system. I suppose a lot of people have this now where, where it's kind of, you, you, it comes out of the, the ceiling. Obviously yeah, not yeah. the record player, which just comes out of the speakers by the record player in the, in the kitchen, but... And then I'll put it on and, and Lola's theme will come on and my, my two young kids are like, oh, not this again. And I'll just have it pumping out, <laughs> uh, you know, on a Friday evening and, and have a beer and relax. And it, it brings back a lot of memories. Yeah, the good times uh, rolling back. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, yeah, it, it would, it's rarer that I, that I listen to, to dance music now with the, uh, with the absence of, of clubs, which is a, a grave shame. Um, for a minute there, I thought you were talking about infernos in Clapham, uh, because I it, it, what was that like? So, I never went there. It, it it was well because you were saying cheesy classic nightclub, right. um, but quite fun to be honest. But but yeah. I mean, I, I really do think kind of clubs that you know they let everybody in and there's no kind of. I'm not at all attracted to the you know there's that club in Berlin where it's sort of you know you've got to look cool but not too cool and you can't look sort of like you dress in fashionable clothing it's all got to be I you know i don't know but yeah but there's this whole uh, tom, kind of tom, how, worry how, about getting in yeah yeah how, how old are you tom i'm 30 yeah right right so so you because nightclub i guess so i stopped going yeah, i wasn't going to, to clubs after so much after my kids were born we still try and go and, and you know me and my wife you know just get hammered one night and you know let our hair down. I don't have any hair, but uh, you know what I'm saying. I think it's important <laughs> to do that from time to time. But uh, um, I mean, what was funny, so this is before the dating apps, you know, like Tinder and I don't know what the others are called. There's loads of them. So I, I, I met my wife just when internet dating was coming to its own. So mysinglefriend.com was kind of the... Uh, was the major dating website, but it wasn't like swiping left or right. I mean, it, it was a completely different thing. So when you went to a club, you, you went to meet people and you, yeah. would, you would talk to people and, and, you know, you would try and dance as well as you could and end up dancing with somebody, you know, that's how one would meet other people. Um, and, uh, the, the worst clubs for me were the very, very snobby ones where particularly in Mayfair, where you, you you know get to the door and it, you know they'd have a list and you mm. had to be on the list and to get on the list you need to know someone who knew someone and you know as an ex ping pong player I was nowhere near cool enough to ever get on the list so you know Tony and I would end up going to places where where you could get in you know like the light bar in the St Martin's Lane Hotel or Sanderson's um, bar at uh, what was the name of that the Sanderson's Hotel Bar and other ones like that and you'd at least be able to get in and, and you didn't get turned away which is always a horrible thing that put a downer on the evening you also don't want to spend time waiting in a queue you don't want to be oh. told by some guy that like dreadful I mean a bunch of usually the people who've been let into those places uh, can, can I mean can often be quite unsavory to be honest and it's sort of yeah, you know, yeah. why am I paying through the nose to get in somewhere where everyone's an arsehole and the music's too loud and it's shit as well. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, exactly. That, that's the sort of experience I have with that. The guest lists and the uh, and the yeah. clipboards and stuff. That is one thing about nightclubs that that um, you know so you I don't, don't mind miss. being taken away by. You, the, by tell the me, Tom. I'm interested. What what do you think it's like for for people in their twenties at the moment? Because you know, I'm in a community where everyone's moaning about, rightly, by the way, it's tough when you've got young kids, right, homeschooling. They're, they're, it's horrible for the kids not seeing their friends. It's really tough when you've got a full-time job. 
But I'm, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about how I would have felt in my 20s, being completely socially isolated from the community, being on my... I, I would have felt lonely almost beyond imagination about being at home, not being able to go to a bar or a club or to go into the office and to connect and to have the social dynamism that is part of being somebody in their, in, in their 20s and, and early 30s. What, what's your sort of take on, on how young yeah, people are dealing people, with it? People are terribly, terribly lonely. And I think that it's worse for university students than it is for people who are in their 20s. I mean, it's very bad for people in their 20s. But I think if you've just gone to uni in your you're just a bit younger, you're a bit less secure. You're still a teenager. I mean, at uni, I was r really insecure when I first arrived and, and immature and really needed to make friends and get out there. I could not be, I would have really struggled to be uh, locked down. And I know, know that's the case for many people, but what's an absolute disgrace is that they're still being, in my opinion, is that they're still charging uni students nine grand a year for some remote lectures, and I'm not. What is, that, is that they're not reduced? What, what, they're not reducing right, it. Then? They're not reducing it. There was, um, yeah. and and I'm not getting at the 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 uni, um, you know, the lecturers and and the professors who, who who are undoubtedly trying their best. It's not their fault. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I know this because I was watching uh, watching an uh, I think it was a TV. TV show or a uh, radio yeah. show, and and the the government, one of the government um, ministers, was was on there kind of defending this, saying you know if they want a refund they can go and ask. You know, if you're taking out a student loan and you're spending nine grand on some Zoom it's not, courses, I it's mean, not be, right. Though. It's just an absolute disgrace. But, and on the like, people in their twenties, you say it's not as bad for them as 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 the students at uni. Go on. What, what's what's your sort of take on that? My, um, the reason why I say that is because at least, I mean, every situation is different, and some people could actually be losing out financially hugely. So you know, to say it black, on a blanket basis, it's easier for one group than the other. I mean, that's a bit fo foolish. But I'm just saying, you know, the, the it's like for the uni students, you're a bit y younger. You need the con that contact even more. You don't. You haven't made your your friends at uni. Like yeah. people in, in their twenties that can can at least have those Zoom calls with their old housemates. They can right, they can right, get in right. touch with their group at uni. Like you've got school, your old school friends maybe, but you've all gone off to uni. You're kind of expecting to start a new life, and you've not had a chance to make those memories yet. To go to clubs, to so you're kind of you're quite isolated. And then on top of that you're really worried about your future. You don't have a job and you're being forced to spend nine grand for the privilege of, of that with no hope of a refund. And then also they've been locking them down in the campuses and stuff. It just seems like they've handled it so badly. I mean, I have no idea how, to, I probably would have just been getting drunk in my room all day, yeah, every day. Yeah, 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 I could see that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just such. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. I, I don't think we've probably spent enough in the media. I mean, a lot of the people who work in the media who are editors, you know, we have children, and we we tend to perhaps think about how difficult it is for that demographic. You're right, students. That's awful. Absolutely. Actually, a lot of editors probably have children. I have read a few stories on this, and I'm surprised ministers haven't um, haven't accepted that 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 something has to. It's not fair. It's what, not what, fair. Why why is it that, that that so much stuff is kind of coming out of the pocket of the taxpayer, which is fine and understandable during a pandemic, but why is there not, why not yes, just ref wrong. refund all the fees out of the taxpayer's pocket? If they're going to spend billions on X, Y, Z, um, I think they should be refunded. It's not. Well, if, there's, if, the, if the educational, if Gavin, Will, is it Gavin Williams? It's Gavin yeah. Williams. Yeah. If, if Gavin, you've had a bit of a rough time, I know during this period, you've not been particularly uh, uh, um, dignified yourself with, with your policies. Here's an opportunity. Tom, Tom Cridland is proposing yeah. the refund. Give him a refund. Let us know what you think, Give him Gavin. a refund, Gavin. Do you have I'm a big sure. do you have, How are you finding your work? I've just started a new podcast on the BBC called Sideways. It's difficult to build. How do you find your audience? How long does it take you to build up a, an audience? And do you have a big? I mean, how? I mean, I'm doing it because yeah, I've got I've got a decent. Put me in touch with you. Said this guy is brilliant, which I can now see. I, I can, oh wow, I can sense uh, the brilliance that's, oozing through the. That's very kind. Yeah, I've got got a decent audience, and it took quite a while, but it was mainly built up in advance with with getting together the name. Um, 
I mean, obviously it wasn't built up in, in advance, but but the possibility of having the big audience, I think, was built up in advance by having the name Greatest Music of All Time and then getting some uh, really great musicians together. And that, that helped grow it. And what are the biggest stars you've had on so far? Annie Lennox, David Crosby, uh, Earth, Wind & Fire, Smokey Robinson, Toto, all sorts of people. Uh, it's been, it's have you been awesome. McCartney? Or, uh, but I have you been sure. in touch with Paul McCartney's uh, uh, representatives a couple of times, and they've been relatively friendly. I haven't managed to, to do it yet. Um, I hope but, you do. I'd love to hear that. Oh, oh, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, fingers crossed. Um, I'm I'm going to uh, refer back to the, to your choices because I'm, yeah, I'm on, conscious that you it. haven't yeah. you haven't told us what the uh, sentimental meaning is behind "Speed of Sound" by Coldplay, which is oh, oh so such a good, great album. Uh, lovely. That's great. "Speed of Sound." Okay, so this is now one of my favourite songs ever, and and the reason I choose it is because um, meeting my wife Kathy, 2009, and as I said. The, the, the groups that were the biggest for her were the Smiths, hugely important when she was growing up, <clears throat> um, and uh, Oasis, she grew up in the 90s, uh, and Coldplay. Now, believe it or not, I knew very little about Coldplay when I met my wife. I ha just hadn't got into them at all. And I went to on a trip to the United States uh, for work, and she gave me um, the... Coldplay albums and I came across Speed of Sound and it was I think it's just a just an extraordinarily sophisticated deep profound beautiful song and uh, whenever I listen to it I'm, I'm grateful to to Kathy for introducing me to, to to clearly a group that writes great music but has evolved through time and has consistently done great albums um, and, and the other thing I love about Coldplay is they met at university Mm. And I, mean, I hope I'm not um, putting down the other members of the group. Chris Martin is clearly the presiding creative genius, but he loves having his team around him. And, and uh, I watched a wonderful documentary on them, and it just seems that the bonds of friendship are still so... I hope it's true. So, I mean, I don't know if they split up since the documentary. I don't think they have, but the, the bond have. of friendship seems so strong. I hope so it's strong. not like, sort of like the Eagles or something behind the scenes, and they they're secretly hate each other. Uh, but it doesn't seem that way. They seem... Also, the way that they were sort of one of the last great ba like bands who, were, who sort of came up playing pubs in Camden and, and that sort yeah. of thing. And when they, when they first broke, they were, you know, they were pretty, they were like living in, in quite, a, quite a kind of squalid like flat and they were, they were you know, they dressed really badly and they, they didn't, they, they weren't at all showbiz, you know, that was kind yeah. of cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, I mean, for sure. And I think um, when you listen to the arc of their music, it's just very clear to me that there's something remarkably um, creative about, about, about Chris Martin. And Speed of Sound, I, I don't have the concepts or terminology to convey why I think it's such a great piece of music, but it's it's partly to do with the number of different musical elements um, that contrast with each other, particularly towards the end. Uh, and I wish I could put that in a more eloquent way, but I, I, I do think it's a remarkable piece of a, a remarkable piece of music. Yeah, it really is. I mean, a lot of it is to do with the sonics of it. I mean, it's a great lyric as well, actually. But, but just that atmosphere is really quite a unique. I mean, there are a lot of people, music critics, who sort of say, oh, they had a bit of a bad downturn with x and y which is the album that speed of sound is on which also has fix you which i think is one of their most beautiful songs and the whole album is really good so i have absolutely no idea why they say that they had a bit of a downturn with x and y so, so critics tend to regard th this particular period as 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 a as a bit of an idea for, for i've read it for more than once yeah about about this um because I, it came after Parachute and A Rush of Blood to the Head, which were which was such huge albums. And even today, people people always sort of say, oh, that was the bit when Coldplay were good. And then, you know, they kind of ruined it by doing all the dance stuff, which I actually think the dance stuff is pretty good. Um, but I think it was just a, a continuation. They were just on absolute on fire with those, those three albums. I think X and Y was my favourite of the lot. And Speed of Sound is... 
a brilliant, brilliant tune. I, I want to um, devote a couple of minutes at the end um, to your books because I, I'm planning on on uh, on reading all of them. Um, not the children's ones yet, but when I have children's, uh, when I have children, I, I will of course uh, be uh, reading them with them. But uh, but I want to get to that. So I want to ask you quickly about your final choice of song, which is uh, Bob Marley jamming. Yes, yeah, so, so I, I ought to say that this is my mum's favourite song. Um, and she, when Andy Wellman wasn't around, she was frankly the one who drove us to my, most tournaments. And she would play um, Handel, um, Zadok the Priest, uh, Rachmaninoff's Second Piano Concerto and Jammin' by Bob Marley. These were her choices on the, on the uh, tape. Uh, my brother was into imagination. Do, do you remember them? Yeah, they 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 were kind of R and B dub, but they but they were kind of R and B yeah, dub group in in the eighties. Yeah, it was, it, you know, just an illusion and music yeah, and light. It's kind of disco. Was, yeah, yeah disco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and really my brother good. loved it. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. been it's been it's been um, selected by somebody uh, who came on. Um, oh, how Murphy. interesting! Yeah, right, right, right. So my brother loved, but but my mum loved jamming, and um, she's an amazing person. We did a Zoom dinner with her last night, with her and my dad, uh, because she was 16 when she had my brother, 18 when she had me. She was quite an innocent girl from the Welsh Valley. She met my father, who was a lot older, um, who was an Indian immigrant, and everyone said, you know, you, you can't get married, your children will be, the term back then was half-caste, you know, mi what we now call mixed race. And they said, you can't possibly run the risk of ruining your children's lives by making them half cast neither one thing nor the other thankfully for me and my siblings they rejected this rather racist advice <laughs> and had their children and uh we're very grateful for it but she's an amazing person and and she was really the rock of the family and she took us to to, to tournaments and and uh and nurtured and, and very wise person and jamming is is her favorite song well, it's a, a very nice reason to choose the song, and it's a superb, superb tune by a by a legend. You know, Bob Marley's music is. I mean, you can't say enough. You can't say enough good things about it because there's, yeah, there's nothing bad you can say about Bob Marley. It's just a brilliant That's song. Fabulous. Like a brilliant and all of his stuff is so so great. I mean, we did we listened to the whole out. I mean, when he passed away, they it went straight to number one. The album, what was it? Was it called legend? The, the compilation now, I can't yeah. remember, but uh, I think it we was. certainly had, we certainly had one of those. Now, now, so you've got um, three books that I would really strongly recommend to my, my audiences because I've been told countless times how good they are um, since starting, starting to read your columns, which are superb, which led me to invite you uh, onto the podcast. As, as I've said, now these books are called bounce, Black Box Thinking and Rebel Ideas, and the most recent of them is Rebel Ideas. Um, what, what's, the, what's the concept behind Rebel Ideas? Because that's the one I'm going to start with. In reverse well, well, interestingly, it, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. About It's about diversity and how when you bring... I mean, a lot of people think, what's the point of having diversity? But when you bring diverse minds together, you can solve problems that no one person can solve on their own. And, it, and, it, and it, it also talks about echo chambers on the internet and how you get sucked in to hanging around with people who think just like you because it makes you feel more, it's more comfortable, it sort of validates your worldview, it's just a lovely thing. And yet it's really limiting your capacity to grow in the way you understand the world, in the way you develop as a person. And it's, it's trying to really bring to life the distinctive power, I think, of humanity, which is connecting different minds together to do incredible things. And it's really a hymn to that concept. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more about, I mean, this is essentially, you know, diversity of opinion is incredibly important. And it seems, like it's becoming less so and and that's not to say i mean the problem is whenever anybody says our oh, diversity opinion uh, diversity of opinion is very important or you know freedom of speech and all that stuff you know usually um you end up being i mean i'm quite a fan of joe rogan's podcast and i i i, I think he's 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 pretty good pretty balanced he's left wing um by the way and uh and you, you sort of read in like BBC and stuff, whenever he's mentioned, it's like alt-right podcaster, Joe Rogan. 
uh, and uh, and so uh, so I think um, whenever any anybody points out kind of the diversity of opinion being a bit of a problem, usually I think people tend to think, oh, you're probably a bit of a right wing a right wing kind of nut job. Well, but, but funnily enough, the, the, I mean, it's interesting you say that. I didn't. I was unaware of that criticism. I mean, diversity of thought. One of the big problems, and I start the book with this is that you can often be a bit unconsciously biased. I kind of alluded to to hang around with people who look like you, who think like you. So if you take the CIA, they recruited very talented individuals, but they're almost all uh, looked like the recruiters. In other words, white, male, Protestant, West Coast, Mm. Anglo-Saxon Americans. And the problem, of course, if everyone has that background, they're very blinkered in the way they see the world. And by bringing people from different backgrounds, different ideas, different perspectives, different cultural sensibilities, it just begins to build the collective intelligence of the group. Um, I'm I'm running a piece for the Sunday Times uh, this coming Sunday about, I mean, this may be after this particular podcast goes out, so I'm talking about the 14th of February, the the edition of the Sunday Times, on how MI6 is now beginning to diversify its intake beyond the very narrow demographics. So I think it's it's actually something, diversity of opinion is something that I think is very in tune with um, what you might call social justice, giving people from all different backgrounds an opportunity to, to do great things rather than constraining them with unconscious bias and other types of other types mm, of that's uh, a very, very aspect. interesting point. But so how do you ensure that it's uh, diverse opinions, though? I mean, do you think it just it lends itself you know, if, if you if you choose people from different backgrounds, different demographics, do you think that automatically is going to lend itself to? I mean, it probably so, is. I think that is it's probably an the solution. No, well, it's an extremely important question, Tom. So this is getting into the nuts and bolts of the argument and mm. the, the place where I think a lot of institutions struggle. I, effectively, if you imagine, uh, Tom. It, so the uh, the short answer it depends on the context. Suppose you are putting together an advertising team. And you were trying to promote this podcast to a very broad group of consumers with different interests and aspirations and backgrounds. If the creative team were all, every single one of them, private school educated, Oxbridge liberal arts graduates, white, upper middle class, you would probably think, and I hope you would, that they're very narrow. That mm. in order to connect with people, with the, di- or let me give a better example: the poll tax. You're, you're a bit too young to remember this in real time, but the poll tax was a conservative policy at the end of the 1980s, which really discriminated against poor people who were unable to afford the tax. The problem wasn't that the people proposing it were were evil; it's that they were just completely unaware of the reality of life when you didn't have enough cash but may have had um, assets to pay a tax. And if you look at the team that proposed the poll tax, there were many of them aristocrats, Mm. William Waldegrave, Nick Ridley, uh, almost all private school educated, and none with a background. If you're you're coming up with a political policy that is going to affect people who live in a a small flat and a tower block, but you have no tacit knowledge of what it is like to live in those conditions, you are missing the nuanced understanding that is required to make the practical policy work. However, in in engineering, if you're putting together a team to design an aircraft engine, the kind of diversity you need there is subtly different. It's probably not cultural diversity, it's subject matter diversity. You want diversity in uh, materials understanding, aerodynamics. Do you see what I mean? Mm. Diversity to give you the best answer collectively needs to be engineered to solve the problem that is before you. And at the moment, so I don't think it should be a box ticking exercise. Yeah, absolutely. It shouldn't be. And it's kind of disrespectful. Right. It's disrespectful to different uh, kind of social and cultural demographic groups. Right to turn it into one. I think a lot yeah, of people it, feel quite patronised by it. I think that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Meet Josh. Josh loves drumming. When he's not practising, he's performing. And when he's not performing, he's practising. Oh, and did we mention? Josh loves drumming. And that's why he chooses d Hey, Josh, show us your skills.
Thanks, Josh. Noise harms your health. Josh knows that. He also knows that gigs get very loud. D-Bud's volume slider means that he can slide from minus 11 decibels to minus 24 decibels in the flick of a switch. And that's why Josh loves D-Bud. The problem with cheap earplugs is they often kill both the volume and the sound. The lower tones cut through the earplugs more than the higher ones. The bass overpowers the treble. There's an uneven attenuation of high and low frequencies and unbalanced distorted sound. Yes, they protect your ears, but you get a muffled and dull sound experience. D-Bud isn't like that. Don't lose your hearing or peace of mind. Get D-Bud today. If you're enjoying the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.